All right, so thanks everyone for coming, uh, especially on a subject that might sound as bland as the gold standard on a Monday night when you could be watching Monday Night Football, I guess. Um, most of you in the room here know me. I see a couple of new faces. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Chris Silber. I'm a frequent attendee of GGLR, Libertarian and Libertarian Party functions, and recently also uh, some Bay Area conservative functions as well. Thanks to, I'll point out Derek Main here at the, at the front who we're cross-pollinating with uh, recently. Um, and I also write a bi-monthly column, economics column, on cautious optimism, which is uh, a political and current events Facebook page. Uh, it's a pretty small time, though. I'm not getting a Pulitzer Prize anytime soon. It's got about 20,000 uh, followers. Um, some of you who were here uh, four months ago, and I did a presentation on Canadian, Scottish, uh, English, and U.S. banking history, uh, may recall that that presentation and the slides are on the small blog site called austrianmoney.blogspot.com. The slides for this presentation are already on that blog, and if this recording software works properly, it did last time, uh, the, the audio video will be on that blog site and on YouTube as well uh, pretty shortly. Okay, so um, moving forward, uh, I'm going to opine a little here. I, I tried to break this, as I always do, into three or four equally sized sections, and I was frustrated. I was simply unable to. So the layout's going to be a little strange. Uh, I just could not pull apart history and theory of the gold standard. The two are simply too intertwined. So I'm, we're going to sit through one long chapter on history and theory of the gold standard, and then we'll close out with a shorter section on some of the fallacies, perhaps some of you have heard it, the constant objections to the gold standard from the public and economists, why it's impossible to go back to gold. Um, I, I, with the blogging I do and the reading I do, I've seen these excuses so many times, I joked if I had a nickel in gold for every time I've heard one of these fallacies, I alone could put the world back on the gold standard. But, uh, but anyway, you'll see what those are in, in a little while. Okay, so let's start with history and theory. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to go pretty quickly through pre prehistory up to the Middle Ages. So if we go back to before recorded history, um, when you had hunter-gatherers and villages and so forth, there was no, there was very little specialization in in uh, primitive societies and economies. Um, although eventually, what economists call the division of labor crops up, and you have people who specialize in a certain kind of production. So the fisherman uh, catches a lot of fish. The wheat farmer grows a lot of wheat. Um, and they end up producing a surplus of what they do, more than they could ever consume, and they end up trading with the surplus production of others uh, for what they need. Uh, this started with crude barter, but barter doesn't work very well, as we all know. It's inefficient for a number of reasons, but the two biggest ones are what economists call the double coincidence of wants. So I'm a fisherman, and I want uh, a farmer's wheat, and, but he doesn't want my fish, so we have to find a third party who wants my fish, but also makes something that the farmer wants, and you can see where this can go. Um, there's also a problem with indivisibility. Uh, if a rancher puts an enormous amount of time and resource into growing an entire cow, and I offer him one fish, he can't divide the cow up into a small enough piece. I guess he could slaughter it, I suppose. But, um, or in the modern age, if we build a house, and I'm, someone makes houses and I have hamburgers, I can't possibly supply enough hamburgers to a home builder in order to compensate them. So primitive societies uh, pretty eventually figured out, all disparate, all across the world, uh, isolated from one another, figured out that some type of uh, medium of exchange was needed that all parties would accept. And you can see a list, a partial list of some of the mediums that societies tried in the past. Rice, wheat, I don't know if tobacco was on here yet. Tobacco was on here. There's an interesting story with that. They tried that in the old Virginia colony, so that's not even prehistory. And it worked fine until farmers started, quote-unquote, minting their own money. I guess you can see where, how that's a problem because it's easy just to grow more tobacco. So um, over centuries or even millennia, precious metals won out in the marketplace, um, not be necessarily because they're shiny or coveted for beauty, but because they have specific physical properties that make them more ideal than wheat or seashells or tobacco as a medium of exchange. And here we have a list. Um, I'm not going to go over this in a lot of detail, but as you can see, all of these apply to, for example, silver and gold, but you can find one of these that uh, wheat might fail at, or fish might fail at, or tobacco might fail at. So the first metallic coins that were minted that we know of 
were in Lydia, which is in central Turkey today, around 630, 640 BC. They find their way to ancient Greece around 500 BC. It's not a coincidence that ancient Greece blossoms into this great society that we hear about today. Um, efficient monetary systems uh, are usually a major crucial element towards the, towards the rise of cer certain dominant civilizations. Okay, so I just covered a couple of thousand years really quickly there. Um, uh, as these coins become more popular, gold and silver are mined and taken to mints in order to, to, uh, in order to melt down and turn into coins. And just a little piece of trivia, anyone here ever heard of the Thaler or Thaler mines before? You've heard exactly, okay, so, okay, gold, gold star for you, right? Um, these famous mines, I think, I want to say somewhere around the 14th or 15th century in what would be the Czech Republic today or Southeast Germany, and they had such a great reputation for purity and their coins were so popular. They spread throughout Europe. Once they got to the English-speaking world, they were mispronounced and called dollar instead of dollar or thaler, and, and that's where the term dollar comes from, from these coins. Hi there. Uh, David Thoreau? No, I'm sorry, I must have been sticky for someone else. Um, in terms of minting, and this is just another interesting piece of historical trivia, um, private mints in some societies competed with government mints, and the private mints in, in virtually all cases um, won out as having consistently uh, superior reputations for qualities, um, also known as sovereign versus private coinage. Um, I'm not a coinage expert, um, but just in some of, the, uh, some of my reading, um, a, for a few examples are um, in ancient Rome, people had to pay taxes with precious metal coins, and once the government got a hold of the coins, they would run them through their mints, melt them down, add a couple of percentage points of worthless base metal, just enough for the coin to still look like it was silver, and then pass it on. And the public eventually knew about this, but what could you do? You're not going to pay your taxes, right? Uh, by contrast, if, you, if a private mint is found out to be playing this game, people simply avoid it, and it goes out of business. So that's, that's a market-based uh, motivation for private firms winning out. Um, also, I don't know if anyone here in the room is familiar with George Selgin. He's an economist you'll probably hear I'm a big fan of several times throughout this presentation. A few years ago, he wrote a book about coinage in Industrial Revolution England, where maybe 20 firms, uh, extremely innovative, the first, the first uh, mint to use a steam press was a private English mint. Uh, they also made high quality low denomination coins for the working classes who were ignored pretty much by the Bank of England and the Royal Mint. Um, a lot of innovation until they were mercilessly crushed in 1821 by an act of parliament that gave the monopoly uh, to the Royal Mint. Okay, so I'm going to bounce back and forth between history and theory. Now that I've established that we mine silver and gold in order to produce this money, uh, here is the theory, and it's, not, it's been proven out by empirical evidence. Uh, there, are in, there are natural free market forces that place inflationary checks, even on mining. We're all familiar with inflation when you print too much money or you add too many zeros on a computer balance at the central bank. But what's to stop people from mining too much gold? And it has to do with the relative value of gold mined versus the value of the gold required to purchase the resources to mine the gold. So I've summed it up here with uh, two contrasting statements. The first is if you mine too much gold, then the purchasing power of gold falls eventually to below the cost in gold terms of the resources required to mine an ounce of gold. So you actually end up losing money on gold mining. Uh, and the reverse is also true that if you mine too little gold and gold becomes too scarce relative to the amount of goods and services in the economy, then the purchasing power of gold becomes greater than the gold cost of resources and then mining operations begin to restart. So in this sense, even without a government, it is somewhat, I did say somewhat, I don't think it's perfect, but it's a somewhat self-regulating process that if gold gets too much mining goes on and it gets ahead of itself, gold miners just naturally due to market forces start to back off. Um, eventually, the quantity of gold stocks will find an equilibrium where the revenues that are, uh, <coughs> that are accrued from gold mining are slightly or marginally higher than the gold mining cost. So it becomes an enterprise of a couple, of, just like, mining steel or mining tin or mining copper. It's an enterprise that if it's too profitable, more firms will rush in and supply will go up. If it's not profitable enough, uh, firms will drop out. Okay, so back to history. Let's go forward now to the Middle Ages. We're going to talk about gold and silver standards, not just gold and silver coins. 
I, I know several people in the room are familiar with the story that uh, particularly wealthy citizens would store their gold or silver for safekeeping at goldsmiths who would then exchange paper warehouse receipts, which were direct claims for the gold or silver on demand. Um, but these goldsmiths over time began to notice that their gold reserves never really reached zero, that people weren't bringing the receipts back on a regular basis to redeem the gold because the receipts were more convenient in the marketplace. It was a lot easier to trade pieces of paper back and forth than to carry a bunch of gold coins everywhere. So these goldsmiths begin the process of simultaneously lending out additional claims on the gold or silver. Um, so now we have more claims circulating than we actually have ounces of gold or silver available. And they're doing this with the expectation that not everyone is going to come back and claim their gold all at once. Um, initially it was banknotes, and then as we get further into history, um, into the late, excuse me, sep the late 18th and definitely into the 19th century, uh, it starts taking the form of demand deposits, and I'm going to mention demand deposits a lot. For those of you who aren't familiar with monetary aggregates, you can think of a demand deposit as a checkbook balance. So it's not a bank note, it's just a ledger entry um, that you can come back and, and you can uh, cash in in order to um, redeem your gold. This process is known as fractional reserve banking. Again, I know some of you in the room are familiar with this. And this talk is not a statement on the morality or lack of a fractional reserve banking. I just want everyone, I know there's a lot of full reserve proponents here. Um, for those of you who are, who, who are not very fond of fractional reserve banking, I only ask that you get familiar with the concept because unfortunately, for better or for worse, the last several centuries, the entire monetary system has been based on it, and you have to understand how it works in order to understand how the monetary system works. Okay, so we now have a gold or silver standard. We have claims on gold or silver circulating in the economy that are greater than the base of actual physical gold or silver available for redemption. So I thought it would help if I drew a little picture here. If we look on the left-hand side, this is kind of what the, the gold standard looked like. Um, I wrote the classical gold standard with no central bank, but this was true even before the classical gold standard, which didn't begin until about 1870. So at the base here, you have a monetary base, which is gold coins. And then above that, you have commercial banks, which I was calling goldsmiths during the Middle Ages. You have commercial banks who receive those gold coins as deposits, and then they issue banknotes, or they make ledger entries in an account um, on behalf of the depositor's, na uh, depositor's name, um, they create a demand deposit balance, which they could, in the modern age, write a check against. And the dollar value of those claims, as you can see in this inverted pyramid, is greater than the dollar value of the gold itself. I thought I would illustrate the contrast with today's system. Today, of course, we live in a fiat money system where gold is no longer a reserve. The base today is Actually, the banknotes up here have moved down here, only that the Federal Reserve has a legal monopoly on the issuance of banknotes now. Commercial banks can no longer issue those. So the base today is the Fed notes in circulation plus the computer balances. These are effectively demand deposit balances, not for the average Joe citizen like you and me. These are demand deposit balances for commercial banks who themselves have accounts at the Federal Reserve. Hope I didn't lose anyone there. You've probably heard that the Federal Reserve is the banker's bank. Okay, so every member bank has an account, just like we have a checkbook account, at the Federal Reserve, and the balance in those accounts is considered a reserve for them to lend against. Um, the commercial banks then uh, issue demand deposits through loans. They'll make a loan in excess of the total reserves available um, just through, nowadays, it's through a computer entry, right? So if they loan money to Derek, they create a new account in Derek's name, and then they just, with a keystroke, they say, okay, Derek's got a million dollars in there. Um, and boom, money supply has increased, as illustrated by this triangle here, okay? Um, as well as, and this is a smaller component, <coughs> um, OCDs, uh, you'd think that'd be obsessive compulsive, right? But that's other checkable, <laughs> other checkable deposit accounts. Um, I'm not too familiar with those as a consumer. Have you guys heard of NOW accounts before? Okay, I'd heard them. I didn't even know what they are. I looked them up. I still don't understand what they are. Okay, but demand deposits are definitely the larger component. And then traveler's checks, which are almost nothing. If you add these together, this is what they call M1 in the United States. Um, I didn't bother to put M2, which is an even larger uh, base above here. But M2 are financial instruments that are not uh, directly redeemable into reserves, Fed notes, or uh, commercial bank uh, balances with the Fed. 
they're directly redeemable into M1 instruments. And uh, we may talk about M2 a little bit later, but uh, some of the major components of M2 are time deposits, savings deposits, uh, certi CD certificates of deposits under, I think, $50,000. i am I'm not sure. It's either $50,000 or $250,000. And then my personal favorite, which is money market shares, uh, this checkbook, okay, I brought, this is my checkbook I brought with me. Um, this is not a Bank of America or Wells Fargo checkbook. It's a money market checkbook. So whoever I write it to, they think it's a regular checkbook, but I'm actually writing a check based on M2 obligations to redeem an M1. And that's an example of how M1 can expand the money supply even further when the money changes hands and someone creates an IOU, in this case called uh, a money market share. Uh, one more example I thought I would add is we had a strange hybrid for 20 years after the initial establishment of the Fed, which is the gold standard era of the Federal Reserve. Um, and in those days, the Fed had gold as its own base. And you'll notice I put coins and bars here because the Fed started melting down some of the coins and turning them into these large bullion bars, and those were f for settling balance of payments between itself and the central banks of, uh, of trading nations, um, plus coins for domestic citizens if they wanted to redeem. And then the monetary base was Federal Reserve notes like we carry in our wallet today, which were redeemable in gold, or uh, Fed credit. That uh, was effectively demand deposit accounts for the banks themselves. So if you think about it, the banks in the Fed gold standard era, they were writing, they were making loans in checkbook uh, and creating checkbook money, not based on the gold, but based on the instruments that the Fed created, which were a multiple of gold, its notes and its deposits for the uh, commercial banks themselves. Okay, a couple more uh, theory items about the gold or silver standard. Um, this is just a language thing, but it's helpful to keep in mind. Um, back during the gold standard era, the dollar, which we think of as a piece of paper today, was literally not a piece of paper. The do a dollar was a unit weight of gold, literally. Um, in fact, so were the pound, the franc, the lira, the mark. All of the currencies of the world during the classical gold standard were not pieces of paper. They were, they were defined as a certain weight of gold. In the United States, a dollar was literally equal to approximately one twentieth of an ounce of gold. The British pound was approximately a quarter ounce of gold, and the French franc was approximately one one hundredth of an ounce of gold. The paper that circulated back in those days, the public called them dollars, but they weren't dollars. They were claims on dollars. And if you've ever looked at an old commercial bank note, can you see here? Step away. It says, we'll pay to the bearer on demand $10. The bank note doesn't say this is ten dollars, and, and that's a, that's a U.S. Uh, uh, bank of National Bank of Sarasota bank note. This is a Canadian Bank of Toronto bank note. Just to show you, it, it, it was true outside the U.S. This says we'll pay to the bearer ten dollars on demand. Okay, so dollar franc lira during the gold standard era is just it's just gold. It's just a, a question of what amount, and for that reason, in in international trade. You might think there were multiple currencies, pound, franc, lira, mark, all different currencies, or all different monies. No, there was only one money. It was gold. Okay. Those, those currencies were simply different amounts of gold. So there were, there were no floating exchange rates. One, one, uh, one British pound sterling was always approximately $5. It never changed. Okay. One dollar was always approximately 20 French francs, or no, if I got that right, no, five French francs. I'll get my bad. So this whole regime of uh, exchange rates, you guys ever go on an international vacation and check what the exchange rate is and it moves favorably or whatever? Okay, this floating exchange rate uh, regime didn't exist until 1971. Prior to 1971, for most of the history of the gold standard, uh, currencies traded at fixed exchange rates. There was no uncertainty in doing international business. And then this last point, this one's so important, in hindsight, I should have created a slide just for this. So sorry that it's at the bottom. Um, there's nothing stopping commercial banks from issuing as many claims on gold or silver as they want, except, and this is extremely important, market forces. That's the check. If a bank issues too many banknotes or issues too many de demand deposit claims on their gold reserves, they always have to worry, of course, about too many members of the public who hold those claims coming back at one time and demanding redemption and depleting the bank of their reserves. But one 
element that's forgotten, which was even more important to the banks, was the threat of a competing bank bringing its claims back. Of course, that quantity is much larger because uh, if, for example, I give a Bank of America note to Nick for payment, Nick's probably going to take it to his Wells Fargo and deposit it in order for his checkbook balance to go up by, let's say, $10. So competing banks accumulate these stocks of banknotes and liabilities from competing banks. Sometimes, it was pretty rare, but sometimes they'd even gang up on one another. Although later throughout history in the 19th century, they tended to be more cooperative. But they would sometimes hold on to their banknotes as long as they could and then submit them all at the same time in, in order to try to put another bank out of business. So that constant threat of redemption is what keeps commercial banks in check. Work very well for those of you who are in my Canada Scotland presentation in June. Okay, and even central banks under a gold standard have to be concerned with overissuance for fear that other central banks or their own citizens might come back and demand too much gold at once. Okay, this threat of redemption also holds true for entire nations. And this is a bit of a mouthful here, but there is a mechanism that born out through empirical evidence for hundreds of years called the Hume Price Specie Flow Mechanism. Like I said, I know that's a lot to, to digest. It was uh, written about uh, by David Hume, uh, Scottish Enlightenment philosopher in I think 1755. He's the one who gets credit for it. For those of you who are in Austrian economics, the Austrians claim that Richard Cantillon, the French-Irish banker, um, that he had anticipated this 20 years prior. That's him down there. So we'll leave it to the historians to argue who came up with the first. But Hume argued that correctly, that if an entire nation's commercial banks or central bank issues too much paper money and prices begin to rise in gold terms, that its citizens will look overseas to cheaper imports in gold terms. Imports will look more attractive. As that country, the one that's overissuing, runs a trade deficit, which it ultimately will, their overseas trading partners will accumulate more and more of these claims, send them back to the country of origin demanding gold redemption, and then the issuing country's gold reserves will begin to dwindle, and it, it either its commercial banks or a central bank, will be forced to stop issuing the money, issuing the credit, in fact, it may even be forced to contract it, until it reaches a point where its products are now cheaper for its citizens than the imports from, we'll say in this case, across the channel. In fact, it may even reach the point where let's say French consumers now see, let's say England's the one doing it, let's say French consumers now it reverses itself. French consumers see English products as cheaper and they begin to import them from England and eventually you reach an equilibrium here. So the Hume price specie flow mechanism is what kept entire nations from issuing too much credit and creating too much inflation because if they did, eventually they would see that their gold was being sent overseas in large enough quantities that they had to stop it. We're going to come back to this Hume price specie flow mechanism because uh, I'm going to get ahead of myself, but I kind of want to whet your appetites. Um, in the 1920s, the Bank of England tries to circumvent this process and sets the stage for the beginning of the Great Depression. Okay, so more history. Let's move forward to colonial America. So um, in the late 17th and uh, up to the mid uh, 18th century before the American Revolution, the colonies of course have to conduct trade and they're using gold and silver, but silver tends to dominate in the U.S. because there's prodigious production of silver from mines in Mexico and also in South America. However, there, were, there was still some gold circulating in the colonies, so you have these two metals circulating side by side, and as the quantity of these metals relative to one another shifts, because let's say Mexico is pouring out a whole lot more silver than wherever the nearest gold mines are, the, the market values of these two tend to fluctuate. Now in the free market, if the value of gold on the, in the open market tends to fall, let's say, lower than the value of silver, that will be reflected in the market by merchants taking gold at a discount. So the analogy I always like to use, you ever bought a book and it says one dollar, well not, not, not anymore today, ten dollars US, but it says $11 Canadian, right? Okay, that's the market reacting to the relative rates of the two currencies. However, governments uh, typically did not leave well enough alone, and they would often try to fix the ratio between the two metals. So, for example, in 1792, in the Coinage Act of the young United States, Alexander Hamilton defined the US dollar as either 15 ounces of silver or one ounce of gold, because that was the going market rate at the time. The problem becomes if there's a new flood of silver comes into the market and the value of silver falls, 
but the government does not allow the price to adjust. Once the gap between those two prices goes beyond what are called the gold points, the gold points is the point above or below the, uh, the ratio at which it's still not profitable to, to, to search alternative means such as melting down the coins or sending them overseas or hoarding them, then a, a, a law of economics kicks in called Gresham's Law, right here, which states that the undervalued metal will disappear from circulation via hoarding, melting down, or export. Now the reason I'm bringing up Gresham's Law, it plagued the countries of the world for centuries. And I have a great example for any of you who are even halfway into coinage. You guys ever held a silver dime or a silver dollar, one of those pre-1965? Yeah. Okay, Derek, for sure. Yeah. Not surprised. Okay, so if you go to, um, I'm just going to pretend you've got 10 of them, let's say a dollar's worth. If you go to uh, the grocery store and you buy a $1 candy bar, and they say, okay, that'll be a dollar, and you pull out a handful of 10 base metal dimes that were printed this year, and a hand of 10 dimes that have silver content in, in them. Legally, the compulsory legal tender, they're both valued at a dollar by the government. Which one do you think you're going to part with in order to buy your candy bar? <laughs> okay, this is an example of Gresham's Law. You're gonna hoard the 10 silver dimes because the market value of those dimes is far greater than the, than the at least the metal, the market value of the metal in those dimes. The intrinsic value is much greater than the value in the government dimes that are just, I don't know what they put them in nowadays, tin or steel or, or whatever, okay. Um, likewise, this plagued the United States, it plagued the European countries for centuries. Governments were constantly trying to fix the ratio between the two, and all it took was a slight deviation on the market by new gold inflows or new silver inflows for one metal to disappear. You may hear Gresham's Law misstated as bad money drives out good. You, ever, you guys ever heard that? phrase before? Okay. Bad money drives out good to me is always sound, and, and, and I don't, this is not an original thought of mine, okay, I, I plagiarized it from uh, Murray Rothbard, but um, it's always struck me as kind of a strange concept. In the free market, don't good products drive out the bad ones, not the other way around? Color TVs drive out black and whites, LCD, LED TVs drive out, I don't know, projection, you yeah. name it, right? Cars with air conditioning drive out cars without air conditioning. Why is money the reverse? Well, actually it's not. It only becomes the reverse when the government intervenes and sets price controls on the money. So uh, bad money will only drive out good when the government attempts to mandate a fixed value. Now the law was named after Thomas Gresham, an finan English financier, I believe, don't quote me on this, I believe he was an advisor to Queen Elizabeth I also. Um, but long before he stated Gresham's law, we think that the first proper statement was by the French bishop Nicola Rem in 1350, and this is a literal uh, quote of his translated, of course, it's, uh, actually it's, it's beautiful. If the fixed legal ratio of the coin differs from the market values of the metals, the coin which is underrated entirely disappears from circulation and the coin which is overrated remains current. Okay, that's about as well as you can put it. Um, I'm debating whether, yeah, I, I can't resist. I, 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 this has, has anyone ever taken microeconomics supply? Yeah, this, this is rooted in microeconomics, okay? For those of you familiar with price controls, if you set a price floor, you don't allow prices to fall below a certain level, you get a surplus of that something. If you set a price ceiling, you don't allow prices to go above that level, you get a shortage, just like toilet paper in Venezuela right now. You know, they set a, a price ceiling on it and, and it disappears. Well, Gresham's Law is simply a manifestation of price floors and price ceilings. So if the silver is worth, if the market ratio of the silver rises above um, the fixed legal ratio, we're effectively imposing a price ceiling on the silver and it disappears from circulation, okay? Uh, if, the, if the value falls below, the value of silver falls below the fixed legal ratio, they impose a price floor on it and then we get a surplus of it. So the undervalued currency remains in cir uh, disappears and the overvalued currency disappears from circulation. It's, it's, it's really literally Econ 101 for those of you who've ever taken that class. Okay, I'm going to change gears totally here. I have, this is kind of a sidebar uh, story. I'm not covering, obviously, every event in the history of the gold standard. That would take, you know, way too much time. Not that I know every event in the history of the gold standard. But it's uh, really well illustrated, and this is an interesting American history too. Gresham's Law f f reared its ugly head in the United States or in the colonies in 1690. And it's going to take me a couple minutes to tell this story, but it's very illustrative. Okay. So um, the first issuance of 
government paper money in the Western world was in 1690 by, and it's right there on the screen, but anyone want to guess? You would think England, right, or France? Actually, it was Massachusetts, okay? So to the credit or to, I'd say to the blame, okay, of Massachusetts, the first, now the Chinese were doing it centuries before, but in the West it actually started here in the colonies. And it started as a result of a, a battle gone bad. So in 1690, this is during King William's War, this is one of the first skirmishes between uh, England and France after the Glorious Revolution when the Catholic uh, Catholic monarchy was expelled in, uh, in favor of a Protestant monarchy. So King William the, I think it's the third, William of Orange, begins what will ultimately be 125 years of warfare with France, and it spilled over into North America. And the Massachusetts Bay Colony, uh, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony government, often finances expenditures by sending armed paid mercenaries up into French Quebec to raid and plunder the French traders, and then they would bring the money back. Um, they'd, of course, get their mercenary salaries, and then they'd give the rest to the government. This is one of the things they don't teach us in grade school, basically, right? Um, and it was, a, it was a very important source of revenue for the Massachusetts government. Well, apparently in 1690, something went wrong, and the mercenaries lost. The French won that time. Maybe they had a good fort, or I don't know, they were armed and ready for us. So the mercenaries come back home, but this time they have no money. Um, now this is a particularly problematic for the government because if your armed mercenaries or your army effectively doesn't get paid, this tends to make politicians very nervous, <laughs> yes. right? Men with guns who aren't getting paid. So the Massachusetts government has no gold, no silver, its credit is shot. This is true, you know, even in, that's true of Massachusetts today probably, right? <laughs> okay. So they're sitting around desperately trying to figure out a way to pay these guys and someone comes up with this new idea in the West. They say, you know, why don't we just issue some paper money? We'll just call it notes and we won't commit to redeeming them, we'll just give a vague promise that we'll redeem it later in a few years when we have the money, and we'll make a solemn pledge, we'll promise up and down on our grandmother's graves, this will be the only time we'll ever do this, and let's, you know, you guys see where this is going? Okay, so, what if, so they issue 7,000 pounds of these paper notes, they pay off the mercenaries, they hold their breath, ho hoping the mercenaries don't rise up and overthrow them, and to their pleasant surprise, it, it worked, okay, the mercenaries left, the notes start circulating, prices go up just a little, nobody really notices. So this solemn pledge of theirs, it only took two months <laughs> for them to decide that the 7,000 pounds would had fallen far short, that's a quote, far short, okay, far short of their needs. So they printed up another 40,000 pounds of notes and declared these as payment for all their debts, pa past and present, or what have you. And within less than a year, the market catches on and these notes are trading at, uh, I believe it was a 40%, did I put it here? 40%, and no, I don't have it here. I think it was a 40% discount to gold and silver the merchants were accepting it. So, yeah, here it is. Notes dep depreciate 40% in the first year. So the Massachusetts Bay Colony government's very upset about this. You know, it thinks that these paper notes should trade at par, 100%, with gold or silver. So in initially, they they, they issue some leaflets and pamphlets criticizing the public. Uh, they're urging voluntary or exhortation. You should be accepting these notes at par. Obviously, the market doesn't pay any attention, and the notes continue to trade at dis discount. So a year later, um, the government takes the gloves off. I'll steal a line from Ray Rothbard. He said, it's like Hitler saying, no more Mr. Nice Guy, right? Okay. And they say, okay, we're passing a law. Compulsory legal tender. These notes must trade at par with gold or silver. As soon as that law is passed and you're forced to accept it at par, what do you think happens to the gold or silver coin in Massachusetts? It disappears from circulation, right? The notes start to continue to circulate, but the now undervalued silver and gold disappears. Hoarded, it's sent overseas and melted, uh, it's melted down, it's sent overseas where we can get a better price. In 1711, the Massachusetts Bay Colony issues another, that's actually half a million, I'm missing a zero. So they, so they go from 7,000 to 40,000, they issue half a million pounds, um, in 1748, they issued two and a half million pounds of paper currency. Okay, I, know, I know this is over a long period of time, but as you can see, they're just creating more and more inflation. <laughs> uh, Chris, so, so yeah. basically, if, if at that time, if somebody had gold or silver, they could refuse to trade it for the notes, and they would because it wasn't a good trade, right? They certainly would not trade it for the notes, but the compulsory legal tender par had more to do with balance settlement in a, a transaction where there was money on one side and a good or service on another. So if you're buying a boat, it, it's more about that. 
and you say, well, I want to give you the paper notes, and the, the boat maker says, hey, I know those notes are pretty lousy. I want whatever, if you take a 40% haircut on it, I want two and a half times the value. Um, the government says he can't refuse you with the legal tender law. He has to take it at face value. So clearly, the guy holding the gold or silver is going to hoard it and pay only with the notes. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other colonies, you know, catch on pretty quickly to this to this game. They start issuing their own their own paper. As you can see, I found some depreciation rates here. So I, I don't know how long this took, but pretty soon the notes are are now trading at 11 to one, or it should probably be the other way around, right? The gold or silver is trading at 11 to one times, uh, or is worth 11 to one times the value on the open market outside of that state um, to the notes. Connecticut, nine, Rhode Island, shockingly, 23 to one. That's that. If my math is right, that's probably something like uh, 4,000, pretty close to 3,500 percent, 4,000 percent inflation. Uh, of the notes. So eventually Parliament or British merchants get kind of sick of being paid with these lousy notes across the Atlantic and they ban the, they, they, uh, they prohibit in 1751 the issuance of these legal tender paper notes by New England colonies and in 1764 they ban all colonies from issuing these paper notes and surprise surprise gold and silver quickly magically all on their own re-enter the economy and begin to circulate again. So if you ever hear, and there are some e economic historians that will say this, if they ever say colonial America needed the government money because there was a shortage of specie, there was a shortage of gold and silver coin, and this is kind of the mainstream position, it's a total myth, okay? There was a shortage of specie because of the paper money, not the other way around. Um, in fact, I think that's what I wrote right here in the last bullet point, right? Government paper money and compulsory legal tender laws created the shortage of specie themselves. Um, I put a picture of Benjamin Franklin here, too, and I, this is probably not polite of me to put this up here, but I wanted to kind of address another myth I've heard floated around. There's this, uh, is, it, is the word acrophical, acrophical, or it's when there's a quotation that's generally public knowledge, but it's not true. Um, Okay, I'm probably going to butcher the word, but uh, I think it's an acro acrophical, apocryphal. apocryphal? Is it apocryphal? Thank you. Apocryphal quote of Benjamin Franklin that floats around uh, a lot of with the gold and silver companies, where he says something to the extent of, "If only, if only the monarchy had allowed the colonies to print their own money, we would have gladly accepted the tax on tea." So he's basically saying we had a revolution because they took away our ability to print money. Have you guys ever heard this before? Okay, I'm surprised. I would have thought some of you would. Okay, well, don't believe it. It's not true. He never, he never wrote or said that. And uh, not only that, if you look in the Declaration of Independence, and I did look, you know, there's a whole list of grievances that the colonies have with the king. You know, he seizes our ships and he quarters soldiers and he's burning our cities or something. If that were true, you would think there would be a mention in there about he won't let us print our own money, and it's it's nowhere in there. Okay, in fact. Um, I'm, I'm not a turncoat, I'm a patriotic American, okay, but, <laughs> but I personally think the colonies were in the wrong. I think in this case, the Britain was right, the par Parliament was right to end the production of this unbacked paper money. And during this period, the Bank of England, uh, even, though it, it, even though it had special privileges, it was acting much more responsibly than the colonies were. At least the Bank of England, your notes were redeemable in gold, um, as were their commercial banks. So if you ever hear that myth, it's, it's not true. Okay, so moving forward, Coinage Act of 1792, I mentioned this earlier, the dollar is defined as 24.75 grains of gold or 371.25 grains of silver, which is an exactly 15 to 1 ratio. People can bring their silver or gold to the U.S. Mint and it, it, will, it will strike coins at that ratio. That ratio was fine in 1792. But it didn't take very long, probably only a few years, because of the inflow of, go of silver from Mexico for that market ratio to fall to 15.5 to 1. And gold, here we go, I, I, I did find the dates. The United States was, for all practical purposes, on a de facto silver standard from 1810 to 1834 because of Gresham's Law. In 1834, Congress moves to correct this problem, although I would think temporarily, right? So they reset the ratio to 16 to 1, which temporarily solves the problem. And then at the same time, Santa Ana is running his own deficits. Um, he declares copper coinage at par with silver, so Gresham's Law in Mexico drives silver out of that country into the United States. 
and more silver comes into the U.S. And um, if I can remember uh, what the result was, with silver flooding to the U.S., that would mean silver is over, is over, yeah, silver would remain in circulation and gold would continue to disappear. Um, this reverses itself in the 1850s when the California gold rush begins. So now California is pouring out prodigious amounts of gold. Now the ratios reverse. Silver becomes uh, undervalued and disappears from circulation. The United States winds up on a de facto gold standard. Can you see how crazy this, this bimetallism problem was? It was a real, it was a real headache for uh, the, the U.S. government throughout the 19th century. Um, the end of the C Civil War, we're still on de facto gold because of gold output. The rest of the world is already joining in on a monometallic standard. They're demonetizing silver and going on what's known as the international classical gold standard. The United States is the last industrialized country to join in 1879. And now with all of the major economies demonetizing silver, the worldwide demand for silver plummets so much that the market ratio falls from 16 to 1 to 18.25 to 1. Now the decision to go on gold only was politically extremely controversial. It may have even been the biggest political issue of the time in the latter part of the 19th century. There were lots of silver miners who were upset about this in the western states and they had a rallying pol political cry called free silver at 16 to 1. It was used in a lot of uh, presidential campaigns. And between them and anti-deflationists, because on the gold standard prices were, because gold can, can only be produced so fast, prices were falling very, very slowly. Um, they united with, uh, there was like a greenback party that wanted to bring back Civil War greenback notes that were, uh, that were unbacked at the time. They wanted more money, more inflation, so they joined forces and they politically applied pressure to Washington to pass the Bland-Allison Act in 1878 that required the remonetization of silver at 16 to 1, and then the Sherman Silver Purchase Act in 1890 which mandated that the federal government purchase 4.5 million ounces of silver every month and coin it at a 16 to 1 ratio. To give you some perspective of how much that is, that was the entire output of America's silver industry every month that the federal government was required to purchase. Um, and this ultimately leads to the second worst depression in American history. We all know about the Great Depression, right? But in 1890, the federal government is buying so much silver and they're issuing this new paper money. It's, it's very plainly called uh, treasury notes. That's it's all it's called, it's treasury notes. So they would issue this paper money, buy it from the silver miners. The silver miners would spend it and it would circulate through the economy. One of the flaws with the treasury notes is it was redeemable because we'll pay uh, to the bearer on demand $10 in coin. It was redeemable in either silver or gold. It was at the ch choosing of the bearer. And of course, silver is becoming more and more overvalued. So what do you think every time someone redeems this note for, what do you think they want? You think they want gold or do they want silver? Okay, they want gold for it. So we get a monetary inflation. The rest of the world is on gold and they don't want to be paid in extremely overvalued silver. So there's a capital flight. The British, the Germans begin pulling their investments out of the United States. And the panic and depression of 1893 began, and it was, it was this, like I said before, it lasted, it took about seven years to get back to full employment. It's a very, very long time. That's about as long as it took Obama to get us back to full employment, actually, now that I think about it. And by 1900, Congress put a stamp on it and said, we're not going to have any more of this ambiguity. The Gold Standard Act of 1900 forbade any more monetization of silver ever again. What initiated the Sherman Silver it was more pressure from the silver miners and, like I said, the anti-deflationists. A lot of the anti-deflationists were basically were debtors. Uh, a lot of them were farmers. So they borrowed money and every year the dollars becoming more and more precious value-wise to pay back the debts. So well, this is a little confusing with 40 to 1. So before it's like 18 to 1 ratio and then it jumps to 40 to 1? Yeah, because what, what what, what, what it's between the, the rest of the world rejecting silver and because of all the prodigious output of silver in the United States that was brought on in part by this legislation. So internationally it floated the 40 to 1 even though they had agreed on an international standard before? There's, there's nothing stopping someone on any commodities market. It's not monetization. There's nothing stopping anyone on a commodities market in London from buying silver if they want. Okay. The going price of silver in terms of British pounds or whatever is different from the going price of silver 
in, in the United States. So Britain was still then honoring it at 18 to 1, even though it was trading at 40 to 1? No, Britain's not, Britain, Britain's not honoring it in any sense. It's trading as a commodity and the number of British pounds required to buy an ounce of silver, which is becoming very cheap, right? If you translate those pounds into a weight of gold and then compare the two ratios, it was, it was effectively 40 to 1. Yeah. So this means the silver dollar at the time. If you melted down the silver dollar at that point to get the silver out of it, you're going to lose a lot of money. Uh, I'd have to think about that one, but that would make sense because with Gresham's Law, if it's an undervalued currency, you melt it down. In this case, the silver was overvalued, so it would be yeah. the reverse. You'd have no incentive. You, you would, you would want to pay all your debts with the silver dollar. You would want to melt down the gold, which effectively is what the British and the Germans did. At least they pulled their gold out of the United States. You know, there's one more. I should have put a bullet point here. There's one more interesting trivia fact about the Panic of 1893. It's a really interesting depression. This, this, you can claim from the U.S. Treasury gold or silver, since everyone wanted to claim gold, the U.S. Treasury itself almost went bankrupt. Has anyone heard this story yeah. before? Yeah. Yeah, they, they, they almost went bankrupt. The, the, US, the U.S. government was saved by a bailout loan from J.P. Morgan. <laughs> well, he, he actually represented a consortium of banks. And it was a real ugly uh, episode. He, took a, he didn't want to have anything to do with it, but he felt he had no choice. He took a railroad to Washington, D.C. President Cleveland didn't want to meet with him, um, and the two men didn't talk to one another for several days, and, and Morgan just waited in a hotel room, but eventually Cleveland had no choice, and he had to call him in. But yes, we always hear about the government bailing out banks. What we don't know is there have been times when the banks have had to bail out the government. Morgan to do it, if I remember correctly, he had some pretty fractional notes to do it, right? That, it, you will know more than me. I don't know what the terms of the loan, of the loan were. Yeah. Okay, uh, moving along. Uh, if we go across the Atlantic to Europe, in 1717, uh, Isaac Newton was the master of the mint, and he tried to fix a ratio between gold and silver, and he got it wrong. It's one of the few things I guess Isaac Newton got wrong. And he ended up driving silver out of Great Britain into continental Europe and put England on a de facto gold standard. And this is what begins the international classical gold standard, which I think will be coming in another slide. Um, it was, again, it was an accident. Um, uh, after Waterloo, and I made a typo here, I'm sorry, I need to fix this. The de facto gold standard becomes, I should have written de jour in 1816 when Parliament passes the Gold Standard Act of 1816 and says, okay, officially we only monetize uh, gold anymore. Um, by the 1850s, th most of the European countries hopped on board with the, with the classical gold standard, and of course the United States is the last one. So by the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, this is a period of enormous international economic growth, by the way, including in the U.S. The U.S. became the world's largest economy in the 1880s. Okay. The international classical gold standard is, forgive the pun, it's the golden age of the gold standard. So when you talk to gold proponents, they love to go back to this, to this heyday when the whole world was functioning very smoothly on gold. All currencies, as I mentioned before, were, on ex were exchanged at fixed rates internationally. We had extreme long-term price stability. Um, I put an asterisk there as a reminder to myself, and I can't remember what it was about, so hopefully it'll come back to me. Um, the industrialized world sees unprecedented expansion of trade and investment. And I have some statistics here. In 1870, International foreign investment was 7% of world GDP. By the outbreak of World War I, it's, it's risen to 18%. And of course, that's 18% of GDP. So that's not just a 150% increase in investment. It's probably a 200 or 300% because the entire world economy, the entire world GDP is growing at the same time. Um, by 1938, which is the Great Depression, you guys know the Smoot-Hawley tariff launched an international trade war and everyone stopped trading with one another it f fell all the way back down to 5%. So that just shows you uh, how international trade flourishes with a gold standard and with, um, and with uh, you know, re removal of trade barriers. Also, international trade itself, not just foreign investment, is 10% of GDP in 1870, and it doubles by World War I. Long-term government bond yields, Okay, so there's no Fed here to engage in quantitative easing to push yields down. This is all on its own in the free market. 3% for a long-term yield in France, 3 and a quarter in the Netherlands, 2.9 in Belgium, 3 and a half in Germany. Does anyone know what the 10-year uh, ten, to ten year yield is in the United States right now, even under? I don't know either. I'm, I'm wondering I, if it's got to be. I too, it's 
Okay, so it's getting close, right? So even even with the Fed printing money, trying to push the, of course they're raising interest rates now, so it's starting to come up. But you know, most fiat money proponents will tell you, well, it's impossible for the government to borrow money cheaply under a gold standard. Well, no, I mean you can see because because everyone knew that prices were going to be stable and there wouldn't be inflation over the long term. Um, corporate, this isn't even government. A railroad bond yield is three three uh, percent. Large corporations were it issuing 99-year corporate bonds. I think the major railroads did that. That's unheard of in this day and age. Because in this day and age, who knows what prices are going to be 99 years from now? Okay, we have no confidence that we, ha we can have any idea exactly what prices will be. So no one's willing to accept a certain return on investment unless it's extremely high, right, um, for 99 years. 30 years is as far as, as, far as it goes uh, in most cases, I think. In fact, just from what I know about my own personal investing, I rarely see corporations even issue 30-year bonds. They're usually 10-year notes or 5-year notes. Uh, I don't see many 30-year out there. Now, by the way, this 99-year thing, okay, this is in the late 19th century. Nobody knew the Fed was coming. I just wanted to, mm -hmm. to mention that. Okay, so they think there's price stability for 99 years. If they knew the Federal Reserve was going to come in 1914, you would have seen these 99-year bonds come to a, you know, grind to a halt. But at the time, they thought the gold standard was going to go on forever. Okay, and then bank notes are still redeemable in gold, and demand deposits are taking a larger and larger share of the M, of what we call the M1 money supply. So checkbook money is becoming dom is becoming the primary form of payment in the world, less so than paper bank notes. Your asterisk was about long-term price stability. Was, there were actually falling prices in lots of areas, right, because of the increased productivity. And yeah, I'm actually you're anticipating another slide, but you know. Chad, that might be why I put the asterisk there. I, I just can't remember. Silly, huh? It's like tying a finger around, a string around your finger. You don't know why you did it. Um, I do want to point out the international classical gold standard was not completely laissez-faire. Okay, if you had no central banks whatsoever, it would be a true free banking international gold standard where commercial banks are constantly receiving international claims for redemption and they're changing their own credit policies based on their own gold reserves. The central banks that began to dominate in Europe at the time were supposed to mimic what would have been the behavior of the commercial banks and the clearinghouses as a whole. Um, and in fact, England uh, had a pretty stellar reputation. It came about as close as any central bank could to behaving honestly um, with its setting of interest rates and with gold inflows and outflows. But there were certain countries that cheated, um, and one of the common forms of cheating was called sterilization. So that meant when you, had, uh, when you had gold inflows, you're running a trade surplus and gold starts flowing into your country, instead of allowing that gold to be monetized to create more money and more credit, they would sterilize it. They would kind of lock it down and put it in a, I mean, not literally in a room somewhere, but they would separate it out and not make it available to the economy because they didn't want prices to rise in their economy and therefore reverse the trade surplus. For those of you who are familiar with the concept of mercantilism, which was pretty dominant in Europe just a century prior. That was the idea. They thought, the governments thought, the best economic policy is export, export, never import, accumulate huge stashes of gold or silver as a war chest, you know, in case you have a war in the future. Uh, it's a lot of kind of like what China is accused of today, right? Just run continuous trade surpluses and just accumulate a lot of money. So sterilizations were a problem. There were periphery governments in Europe that engaged in devaluations uh, and in Latin America. Um, but two, real, two of the stellar countries, Great Britain and the United States, uh, Great Britain never devalued from 1717 to 1931, excluding uh, uh, World War I, where they went off the gold standard in, during the Napoleonic Wars. And the United States did not devalue um, between, technically, I should say, 1834 to 1933, because they had to redefine the dollar, um, the gold-silver ratio in 1834. But I'll, I'll say from the founding of the country to 1933, there were no devaluations. So those two countries <coughs> um, received deservedly uh, stellar reputations. Um, probably should not have included this last bullet point. Uh, for those of you who sat in on my June talk uh, about Canadian and U.S. banking, it was a golden era, but not so much in the U.S. because you probably heard we had lots of banking crises and financial panics in the U.S. That was not because of the gold standard, no matter what you read in the newspapers. It was because of these prohibitive unit banking laws that we had in the U.S. that forbade banks from branching beyond a single office in most cases, so they couldn't diversify their loans. It made them very vulnerable 
um, to changes in their local economy. Okay, so to touch on something Chad brought up, that is what it was, Chad. See, I've got long-term price stability with an asterisk there, so that's exactly, you know, great minds think alike. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, so there was long-term price stability during the classical gold standard, but it, prices weren't perfectly stable. Prices actually fell. I don't know if any of you have heard this. In, in, in our lifetimes, we expect prices to rise. We think it's just a natural part of the economy. It's not a natural functioning of the economy. Prices always rise in this era because we have a central bank called the Federal Reserve, which is tasked with deliberately printing money faster than the economy grows in, in order to create price inflation. During the classical gold standard, the money supply was more or less dictated by the rate of increase in mined gold that was monetized. So uh, you can, and I, I'm sorry to get mathematical here, but this really is the best way to, to think about it. If we take the uh, so-called equation of exchange, which is a strong tenet in the monetarist school of economics, um, and it is, it is considered a, I think it's called a tautology, it's basically a truism that doesn't require proof, um, of MV equals PQ, sometimes the Q is a Y instead, Q is uh, total output of goods and services and Y is GDP in dollars. We can, we can kind of see why prices fell uh, mathematically during this period. So in this equation, M is the money supply, V is the velocity of money, how rapidly the same dollars turn over in a year. P is the price level, and then Q is the total output of goods and services. So if we isolate P using some junior high algebra, we divide both sides by Q, we get prices equal money supply times velocity divided by total output of goods and services. I'm going to exclude for the moment velocity. I'm going to assume velocity is constant just for the sake of simplification. So this means prices rise in proportion to the rise to the uh, rate of increase of the money supply, and prices rise disproportionately to the rate of increase of goods and services. You know, you guys heard the term before, right? Too many dollars chasing too few goods. So if M goes up more quickly than Q, or Q remains constant, prices are going to rise. If M doesn't move, but Q moves up, then prices are going to fall because Q is in the denominator. So in, in this day and age, we hear uh, the mainstream economics community, which is dominated by the Keynesians and even the monetarists, they say no deflation at any cost. It's horrendous. If there's any deflation, we'll have a Great Depression, which is really odd considering there was deflation throughout this period, and the U.S. economy grew to be the largest in the world during the same period. And their critique is this. They're arguing that, uh, their critique is, with deflation is that they, they present it as the money supply collapsing, which is what happened to a very small degree during the uh, financial crisis in 2008. And it's what happened on a much larger scale during the Great Depression. So this is true. When the money supply falls due to a financial crisis or banks failing, if the money supply falls 5%, all other things being equal, prices are also going to fall 5%. And that's why they tend to associate deflation with depression. But during the classical gold standard, that wasn't the phenomenon that took place. Instead, what happened was the output of goods and services rose faster than the output of gold. So if the numerator in our equation goes up 3% a year and the denominator goes up 4% a year, the net result is that prices fall almost 1% a year, to be precise prices fall by 0.96% a year. This is what we call gentle secular deflation. It's a benign thing. It's actually an indication that the economy is growing very rapidly. And it's something you will probably never read about in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Instead, you're going to hear all about how all deflation is horrible. I mean, I've even read articles saying zero inflation is horrible. And I've even read that not enough inflation is horrible. Have you guys read that? Like, oh, we only have 1% inflation. Uh, there's going to be another Great Depression, okay? It, it, don't believe it, okay? It, it, deflation does not equal depression. In fact, deflation during the classical gold standard was associated with prosperity. Yeah, question, George? Isn't this just an excuse or a scam that as long as there's inflation, there is increasing the amount of uh, debt-based money as loans into the economy? So there's I'd agree. You, you already know how I feel about this, George. I'd agree with the first part of your statement, the debt the debt-based money, I'm not necessarily going to agree with. But it is a scam, and when I get to the part about the Fed a little bit later, uh, I, I, I personally think it is a scam, I would call it that. It's, it's so the government can run continuous deficits and pay them back in 30 years with less valuable, less valuable money. Okay. 
I think that like today, deflation would probably be much higher because of technology and efficiency. So there was, wasn't a lot of gains. That, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Uh, I've mentioned Murray Rothbard before. He's an economist I'm a fan of. He, he would mention, when he was alive, he talked about computers. Say, look how much the price of computers has fallen, a lot faster than 0.96% or 5% a year. Now, do we have a Great Depression in the computer industry? Well, well PCs, maybe we do nowadays because of yeah. tablets, but you know, what I'm, you know what I mean, right? Or televisions, right? Televisions get cheaper and cheaper. The quality gets better and better. Is there a depression in the television business? No one's running out and buying televisions anymore? No. No, not at all. Okay, um, okay and I, I promise this is as wonkish and nerdy as I will get. Um, th this is a, for those of you who studied economics in school, this, these models basically illustrate the same concept. Um, on the left hand side we have what the mainstream economists want you to think deflation would mean. So here we have a aggregate supply curve and there's a, there's a collapse in aggregate demand which doesn't necessarily mean people aren't buying as much. It could mean the money supply is falling. So people have fewer dollars in general to spend just because there are fewer dollars available. So when aggregate demand falls from AD1 to AD2, the equilibrium point where the curves intersect falls from P1 to P2, and that's deflation, that's falling prices. On the other hand, during the classical gold standard era, this is good deflation. This is lower cost of production. So we have a downward sloping aggregate demand curve here. We have, this really shouldn't be S short run, it was the best one I could find. They should just call it AS, not short run aggregate supply. But the aggregate supply curve shifts to the right because firms and companies are able to produce more stuff at the same price. And the equilibrium price from curve one to curve two falls from point P1 to point P2 because prices have fallen. If this confuses you and you want to understand it, the slides are going to be on the, on the blog site. So feel free to pull them down and analyze them all you want. But economists tend to like these models because they feel that they illustrate the concept more clearly than, than just the math. Okay. Um, okay. Actually, I had planned to take a short break here and to take questions, but we've already had some questions. So are you guys okay with if I just keep going? Okay. This is, this is my opinion. To me, this is the most important chapter in the history of the gold standard. And I feel, I personally feel it may be one of the most important chapters in the history of money period. And this is how the gold standard died. Okay. And for those of you who sat in on my Great Depression talk last year, this may look familiar, so if I'm repetitive, please forgive me. But personally, I think it's worth seeing again because it's so, so important whenever you hear about how the gold standard failed during the Great Depression or the gold standard caused the Great Depression. Okay, it's total nonsense. So when World War I starts, all the nations of the world, except for the, all the belligerent nations, I'm sorry, of yeah. the world, go off the gold standard except for the United States. The U.S., of course, we entered late in 1917. Um, and even then, the U.S. banned the export of gold. So we were really only on a domestic gold standard. Gold could not flow abroad. And the, these belligerent nations printed so much paper money to finance the war. You can see by 1918, the end of the world, you can see how much the currency is depreciated here. So the pound sterling is the best off, even though a 35% depreciation means prices rise by over 50%. Um, the French franc is in lousy shape. The German mark, even before the Weimar Republic hyperinflation, had already lost 96% of its value. So when the war is over and the nations of Europe want to go back on gold, it's going to be really hard to go back on gold at the original definition in terms of gold, weight of gold because you have the same amount of gold, maybe even less now, and you have 20 times as much money or twice as much money or three times as much money, and it's simply not credible. When people cash in their redemptions, you're going to run out of reserves. So most countries did probably the, most, the best of all the bad choices was to devalue. They redefined their currencies as gold, but at a much lower weight in order to support, so that that same stock of gold could support a larger quantity of money. But the one exception was UK, was Great Britain. Okay, Britain wanted to return to the, wanted to return to the gold standard. It didn't have the gold to do it, and it refused to devalue the pound because it wanted to recapture the old glory of rural Britannia or whatever. And there was probably also a political unawareness on part of British politicians that the financial center of the world really had moved to New York at this point. It was no longer London, although they, they wanted it to be. Um, Britain could have gone back to gold at the old par, which was technically $4.86 US to the pound, 
but that would have required a painful deflation. That is, the money supply would have had to have shrunk in order to be realistically supported by the same quantity of gold. And Britain had traditionally done that after the Napoleonic Wars. They took the, they took the recession, they took the deflation. The United States did it after World War I. We had a depression in 1920, which was basically the U.S. reversing the inflation. But England wouldn't do it. So they consulted two of their experts. Uh, I'm guessing some of you can identify at least one of these experts. Anyone want to take a shot at it? Yeah, yeah, on the right, that's Keynes, okay? The other is, I'll, I'll, I'll joke, I'll call it his evil twin, okay? That's Rafe Hawtrey. They were both Cambridge products. They had a lot in common. They went to school around the same time. Neither of them had an economics degree. That's kind of an interesting um, point. Um, Hawtrey worked at uh, Treasury, and Keynes was at Cambridge. So they decided to put Britain back on the gold standard, but it wasn't the classical gold standard. They went on to what I call the gold bullion sterling exchange standard. Okay, but it's, if you read about an economic history, it's referred to simply as the gold exchange standard. So what's different about this new system? Okay, for starters, no coin anymore, only bullion bars. So all the coins at the Bank of England were melted down into these minimum 400 ounce bars and if you held Bank of England banknotes or Bank of England liabilities, you could, ca you could still cash them in, but only in a minimum of one of these bars. Now, I don't know if you guys can appreciate how much money that is. Today, a 400 ounce bar at the current price of gold is about half a million dollars. And back then it was 1,700 pounds, which is probably close to half a million dollars in today's money. So this mathematically excluded 95% of their own citizens by design. They wanted to make it impossible <coughs> for their own people. To, to claim to um, to uh, claim their their gold, um, uh, actually shortly thereafter they just said, oh let's 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 just make it a formality. British citizens were British citizens were legally banned anyway, so you couldn't redeem for gold um, at all. Only foreign central banks could. Now what does this do for England? If your own citizens can't redeem in gold, which means you know that gold is not going to leave the door, that permits you to do what? Print more money. Okay, you, you can support your existing, your existing money stock and you can, you can create more inflation because you know you're not going to be held to account by your own citizens. All right, furthermore, they went, they went even further than this. They said, okay, it's not even going to be a gold standard. We're going to create a gold exchange standard, okay, which means the gold stays at the Bank of England and we're going to print more pound sterling liabilities that will flow overseas when we run trade deficits. But continental Europe, we're going to quote unquote encourage, or I think I used the word persuade it, right? <laughs> okay, we're gonna persuade because other European nations were in debt to England. England dominated the finance committee at the League of Nations. So we're gonna, we're gonna persuade them to hold our pound sterling balances as quote unquote equal to gold. They're gonna basically treat it as if it was gold and their central banks will use it as a reserve upon which they will inflate more of their own paper currency. Okay. Yes, yeah. The only difference is there's actually a little bit of gold in this formula, okay, <laughs> unlike today where there's none whatsoever. So just as a reminder, this is the way it worked. This is the old system. Under the classical gold standard, the Bank of England uh, had, had a gold coin. It would issue, uh, it would issue Bank of England banknotes. Um, some of the UK private banks had, uh, had small quantities of gold coin for redemption if citizens wanted to come and and redeem. Eventually the country ran a trade deficit, these pounds sterling balances would pile up on the continent and then here's the key, this red line is so important, okay, that's the threat of redemption I was talking about. The sterling remittances go back to the Bank of England, Bank of England is drained for gold and the Bank of England has to stop the inflation. Okay, so that's the way it worked under the old system. Under the new system, all of the gold was centralized in bullion bars at the Bank of England the country runs trade deficits. These bank, these Bank of England um, pound sterling notes and liabilities pile up on the continent, but they don't come back. And, and, and instead, the foreign government central banks start printing more of their own currency, pretending that I probably shouldn't say pretending, but it really was pretending that these Bank of England banknotes are like gold, like a reserve. Okay. Now, all this time, keep in mind these foreign central banks have the right to submit these pound sterling banknotes back to the Bank of England and redeem them for gold. But they didn't because one, they were persuaded not to, and second, because at least for the time being, it was in their interest 
they like having more reserves because it allows them to create more inflation too, right? So for at least a while, they were happy to accumulate these sterling balances uh, at their own central banks and create more of their own money. Now, what was the rationale behind this? I think everyone in this room can kind of see how this is sort of a jerry-rigged house of cards. Okay, they could collapse at the first sign of trouble. The rationale were, that I could find, other than the, the, the unofficial rationale, of course, is we want more inflation. We don't want to have to deal with the consequences. But the official rationale, number one, Keynes argued, well, it's cheaper this way. Instead of having gold constantly floating back and forth across the channel, it's cheaper to maintain credit at one of the great financial centers of the world, which can be converted with great readiness when it's required. I've never understood this cheaper argument. I mean, if you compare it to the cost of the macroeconomic distortions that creates in the entire world, I think those costs are much greater than shipping a little gold across the channel. And some of you may know, the gold usually didn't even move physically anyway. It just got shifted at the Bank of England from one side of the room to the other. So I, I've never bought into that. You know, they, they, Truly, in fact, I think uh, like the Fed, you guys know the Federal Reserve today holds gold on behalf of other central banks. It's all underground and it, it just moves, right? They just move it from the Germany corner to, well, I think the German gold's gone now or something like that. But they move it from the Italy corner to the France corner or, or whatever. Okay. Um, but the other rationale, and this is one of my f personal favorites, uh, he also attacked the gold standard saying that a pref preference for a tangible reserve currency, i.e. gold, is is a relic of a time when governments were less trustworthy in these matters <laughs> than they are now. Okay. So evidently, we've had over a century of perfectly trustworthy governments yeah. in monetary matters. Okay. Okay. Before I uh, talk about how this all kind of fell apart in Europe, it didn't end there. It spread to the United States because even though England was able to get the European countries to go along with this, the United States was not willing to accept paper Bank of England pound notes. The United States wanted gold. So there was still a mismatch in prices between England and the U.S. and England was still running uh, chronic trade deficits with America. Well, no problem. In 1927, in July, this is the governor of the Bank of England. This is um, Montague Norman. And this is the uh, governor of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That's Benjamin Strong. These two were, were buddies. They were close personal friends. They vacationed together. They had a lot of personal correspondence. Norman came over to the U.S. and he persuaded Strong he persuaded Strong to engage in a major Federal Reserve inflation in order to raise our prices, in order to match England's prices to stop the trade deficits. Um, so in this meeting we have uh, the governor of the uh, uh, the Reichsbank, uh, he's, he's not in the picture, he, he is actually standing over here in the Bank of France, uh, deputy governors over here. They announced to the uh, governors of the Bank of France and the Reichsbank, we're doing this, it's a fait accompli. The other two countries didn't like it, but they didn't really have a lot of choice in the matter. Um, and when the announcement was made, this is a quote that should be in the business section once a week of the New York Times, but it never is. Uh, Strong turned to uh, Charles Riss, the deputy governor of the Bank of France, and he joyfully exclaimed, I'm going to give, quote, a little coup de whiskey to the stock market. So even in the 1920s, the Federal Reserve governors understood what the implications were of printing a lot of money, um, that it would bleed over in asset markets. And I think most of us know kind of the rest of the story, at least for the next two years, right? The, the, the Fed, this you may not be familiar with, the Fed expands its balance sheet by 55% in only 17 months. And the money supply rises uh, in this six year period. I picked the end of the depression of 1920 to 21 to the point where um, the quantitative easing of the Fed stopped, the money supply rose uh, an average of 6.3% per year in that six year period, which is much faster than the growth of the overall economy. But keep in mind, a disproportionate amount of that monetary growth occurred in the last 18 months. So money is spilling over into the stock market, into the real estate market. You guys have all heard about the bubbles and the speculation leading up to 1929. Uh, Benjamin Strong, who was always sick, he died from tuberculosis in October of 28, and the new Fed leadership ended the open market purchases in January of 1929. So starved of new money, the stock market begins to falter in the summer, and we all know right about the, the crash in October. So now the world is going into recession, not Great Depression yet, into recession. And the European central banks begin to go to the Bank of England and ask for some gold. 
Uh, France, which was a huge holder of Bank of England liabilities, expressed a desire to convert some sterling to gold. And Norman threatened to devalue if he went through with his desire to claim his gold. And he assured uh, the governor, not the deputy governor, the governor was um, Emile Moreau. He assured him England will never go off gold. I'm sure you can see where this is going. Okay. Uh, on September 18th of 31, the Bank of Netherlands governor, Gerard Visserling, he expressed a similar concern. And Norman told him, quote, uh, he told him that the Bank of England will remain on gold, quote, at all costs. That's on September 18th. Two days later, on September 20th, the Bank of England goes off of gold. Okay. So that's 237 years, 237 stellar years of peacetime pledges that the Bank of England made good on to convert, and it ends after 237 years. The Federal Reserve now is the largest, uh, it, it was before and it still is the largest holder of gold reserves of all the central banks, but you have to remember, compared to the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve is a toddler, because at this point it's only been in business for 17 years. So the world is really beginning to question now, the last remaining major central bank, what is its commitment? How well is it gonna stick to its commitment? So the Fed immediately saw an increase in international calls for dollar redemptions for gold. And uh, I'm going to get to the Fed in just a second. But meanwhile, it, you, as you guys can tell, the whole thing collapsed. Okay, by this point in 1931, the gold standard collapses in Europe. So I had to include this quote from this wonderful fellow, okay, who in his Brookings Institute blog made a comment about the gold standard of the 20s. And he claims that it was brought down by a failure of surplus countries to participate equally in the adjustment process. So in other words, that means that the central banks of European countries that accumulated large stocks of gold were not cooperating properly. That is, they should have refused, they should have, with, they should have um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, uh, abstained from, from trying to redeem some of their rightful claims uh, into gold, okay? I don't know if you guys see what I see. I see the root problem is not central banks cashing in their legal right for gold. I see the problem that the whole system was designed for the Bank of England to print far more liabilities it could ever credibly hope to redeem in the first place. And the, the point where it got too far, finally some central banks get nervous. According to Bernanke, it's their fault for getting nervous in the first place, right? Um, I probably shouldn't confess this, but I wrote a comment on his blog uh, uh, criticizing this, and uh, for some reason, Ben Bernanke, I, he just didn't think I was important enough to, to respond. Okay, but it, it's st it's still on there talking about the gold exchange standard and and how the gold exchange th the gold standard didn't fail. It was never really a legitimate gold standard in, in the first place. So Britain never never revalued. Uh, so event so Britain never allowed gold redemption for its own citizens ever again. Um, it did devalue the pound for later for international trade purposes, but that only lasted a couple of years because as soon as World War II started, all of the nations went off gold completely, even in terms of international trade. And then we'll see at post-war the Bretton Woods Agreement, for those of you who are familiar with it, the Bretton Woods Agreement, no countries other than the United States allowed redemption for gold. So for all practical purposes, uh, British gold convertibility for domestic citizens was over forever and for, for uh, balance of payments, it was only for a couple of years after a devaluation. Yes. And the idea of the devaluation is to come closer to being in line with the actual amount of currency that they print, right? Or that that's true, but it also, more importantly, in a depression, it serves the purpose of making suddenly your goods appear cheaper. The same way the Chinese are criticized for devaluing the RMB or the Japanese devalue the yen, it's all it's it's uh, beggar thy neighbor economic policy. It's an attempt to solve your problems at the expense of your trading partners. Mm -hmm. So after, I, I don't want to get too deep into this just for the sake of time, but once the United States went off gold and fr France was the last country to go off gold, all of the nations began to competitively debase in order to get a, a trading advantage upon one another. And there were actually several conferences in the 1930s where the countries were trying to stop this competitive debasement and at least settle on a, on a level where th that they could all live with. Okay, so what happens in the U.S.? As I mentioned, in September 31, gold starts flowing out of the United States because people overseas are nervous. So the Fed did defend the dollar by raising interest rates. That did stop the gold outflow. Um, however, 
once gold started coming back into the United States, the Fed sterilized the gold inflows. And this is a highly controversial point. It's, this is actually one of the points that Milton Friedman won the Nobel Prize for when he did some research and criticized the Fed for not allowing the new gold inflows to be monetized because the United States was undergoing its own extreme deflation at the time due to all of the bank failures. Um, meanwhile, we have a lot of banks, some of which are ins insolvent, but most of which are solvent, but just have a temporary liquidity problem approaching the Fed discount window asking for a lender of last resort temporary liquidity loan. That is a function of the Federal Reserve. That's why it was created in the first place in 1914, and the Fed refuses to act. It sits on its hands and it stands by and allows 9,000 banks to fail by 1933. The money supply in the United States contracts by a third from 1929 to 1933, which is unprecedented in American history, and it's a major contributing factor to the Great Depression. It even goes further, according to Richard Timberlake, who was, uh, he's now in his 90s, but he was a Milton Friedman student, um, he accused the Federal Reserve of, of applying a policy called direct pressure <laughs> against the commercial banks, which is basically, okay, you might need temporary liquidity loan and you may be solvent, but if we perceive you as to having loan for stock market speculation in the 1920s, you're not getting the loan and the banks effectively would fail. Um, this is considered universally by Keynesians, monetarists, even Austrian economists as a major failure, policy failure on part of the Fed. I mean, it was created to be a lender of last resort. It nationalized that function from private banks that had, had previously been the lenders of last resort. And then when the time came to actually act, it, 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 did, it didn't do anything. Um, yeah, I think I've gotten ahead of myself, right? 9,000 banks fail, the money supply falls a third. Um, FDR, to make matters worse, uh, people suspect he's gonna devalue the dollar or even go off gold completely. He won't answer questions about that during the debates. Everybody gets very nervous, so it, as soon as he's inaugurated, everybody starts pulling both their cash and even their gold out of the Federal Reserve System. And as you can see, this chart, this is the money supply. It falls from about $48 billion to, you know, about 30, a little over $30 billion. Uh, this is, uh, you won't find the overall money supply, you will not find an event like this anywhere in our history, except for the four, first four years of the Great Depression. Um, so in April of 1933, FDR issues an executive order uh, uh, com commanding, uh, is that a good word? Okay, all Americans to surrender their gold to the Federal Reserve in exchange for $20.67 an ounce. So it becomes illegal for private citizens to own gold. Some of you may know it would remain illegal all the way until 1975, I believe, until Gerald Ford finally made it legal again. He then immediately devalues the dollar for international trading purposes to $35 an ounce. This is so the United States can get a leg up um, on, in international trade. And the what did he do to distract the people when he did all that? I don't, th he may have, I don't know. I don't know. So he did it when they ended prohibition, so everybody's thinking prohibition then, didn't they? I, okay, I, I didn't know that. I didn't know there was any distraction. I, I, right about the same time. Really, I, my, my impression, and look, I'm not an expert on what his strategy was at the time, but my impression was that the country was so desperate at the time that the people would let him do just about anything. I, um, I think he pretty much flim flammed the public with his fireside chats. He <laughs> needed to do this to stimulate oh. the economy. Oh, I'm sure he gave an explanation, said this would be good for the economy. Right. And yeah, I'm, I'm going to open a can of worms here. I mean, the, the, the money supply really did have to be reinflated at this point, but why not let, why not have the Fed? de-sterilize right. the gold. Uh, the Fed still had plenty of room to create more. They were on a 40% reserve ratio. They hadn't maxed it out. Even if they had maxed it out, it's not the law. It's just their own internal policy. They could have gone to a 20% reserve ratio. Why not let the Fed make the emergency loans like it was supposed to? Oh, these, these are all things that would have prevented the deflation or at least reversed it. But instead, FDR went straight for the jugular and said, we're just getting rid of gold completely. And I guess people can debate whether he that was part of a larger design or not. But um, this, this had already been happened to British citizens uh, earlier before. But for a different reason. Yeah. Uh, British citizens lost their right to convert in 1925 under pretty stable circumstances. It took a crisis in the United States for American citizens to lose that right. But, you know, I'm but wondering in, in their situation, what were the, what were the British citizens told? I mean, didn't, wasn't there kind of like an upcry or, I guess, uh, or, or 
no outcry. Uh, that's a great question, George. If someone wrote a book about it. I'd love to read it. Yeah, that's a really good question. I haven't read anything about uh, British public reaction. Um, although, keep in mind, Britain had been off gold for 11 years already. They went off in 1914 to fight the war. So perhaps the public has become accustomed to this. I don't, I don't know. I don't they deal with contracts and stuff that were nominated yeah I think he so like if you took out a mortgage I mean they did have that's that's such a good number of gold that's such a good question I have a feeling you already know the answer to that if you're asking that question right so, I, mean, I didn't include a bullet point but there was an act somewhere around the same period where I, they I do recall reading the answer about this yeah don't they uh, they nullified the government nullified exactly. all gold contracts and, yes and the other, the other question yeah. comes I'm wondering if part of the reason that Roosevelt stacked the Supreme Court was so that he could control the outcome if this was challenged. Can you save that for, I know the answer, okay. can you save that for overtime? Okay. Uh, I, I'm looking at the clock, oh that clock's, oh my god that clock's uh, slow, it's not even fast, I'm going to be running even further, be, I'm, right I'm further behind than I thought, okay I got to keep moving, sorry folks, okay, so. Um, okay, so on April 20th, 1933, the U.S. declares it's ending the gold standard. Uh, I wrote forever, however, the announcement, this is the New York Times on that day, the, it was for the present, uh, was the official announcement, but we all know the history now, right? It, it was forever. Okay, so then uh, World War II breaks out, all the nations of the world go off gold completely, even for international trade, and when it looks like the Allies are going to win, the nations of the world, uh, they convene in Bretton Woods, uh, resort in New Hampshire to discuss a new uh, post-war um, world monetary order and the conference is dominated by the United States and Great Britain. Uh, the U.S. Representative Harry Dexter White is a brilliant Assistant Treasury Secretary and in fact he really dominated. England was so bankrupt by this point um, Keynes is trying to get better terms for Britain and he was politically outmaneuvered by White. Um, Chad and I were talking about this over dinner about a week ago. There's a great book, if anyone wants to read about Bretton Woods, it's called The Battle of Bretton Woods. I highly recommend it. Uh, the economics are a little complicated. I had trouble following some of it, but the politics are really intriguing how, how Keynes was, um, was um, outmaneuvered. Um, and then shortly after the Bretton Woods Agreement, Harry Dexter White was discovered to be a Soviet spy, uh, passing on financial information to the communists. Okay, so here's the conference room. So the terms were that the dollar would anchor the entire world monetary system. Uh, the dollar would be convertible at to $35 an ounce. All other currencies, the pound, the franc, the mark, would be convertible at fixed rate to into dollars, but not into gold. Okay, and only foreign central banks could convert to gold, not foreign citizens, not American citizens. So under this new gold, quote unquote gold standard, uh, only foreign central banks are allowed to redeem gold, and they're only allowed to redeem American gold. Uh, I am going to throw out, this is a little bit of a tough question, does, it, does this look familiar, this arrangement? Does it look similar to anything we just talked about? Yeah. Okay. This is the gold exchange standard all over again. It's the British gold exchange standard all over again. Okay. The only difference is it's the U.S. is, the, is where the gold reserves are. Okay. But in every other respect, it's almost identical. And this, of course, is the beginning of the dollar as the global reserve currency. Even though Nixon went, took, uh, took the U.S. off even the international gold standard in 71, there was so much inertia at that point to dollars being a reserve that uh, it just remained a reserve currency. Um, here's a modern day shot of the Bretton Woods Resort. It's a pretty swanky place, and they, there's a little historical marker. Um, uh, one of the problems, this of course is modern day, if I had been able to take this picture in 1944 you would have seen dark clouds forming, okay, above <laughs> that, um, but, but not now. And of all the ironies in history, I don't know if you all are knew this, the Bretton Woods uh, Resort is at the base of Mount Deception, that's kind of an interesting, <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Yeah. They named it afterwards. Yeah, so I think it was Deception prior, that might have had something to do with the choice of location for the, uh, for the conference. Okay, so now the world is, is inflating based on American gold reserves, but there is a finite supply of gold, and that limits American and global inflationary policy. But by the 1950s, the world is in love with Keynesianism as a monetary policy, which means perpetual inflation. 
So this manifests itself through Lyndon Johnson's administration. He's continuously running deficits, and the Federal Reserve is printing more and more dollars to oblige him so that he can fight the Vietnam War and pay for the Great Society. And as more and more dollars flow overseas, the credibility of the United States' ability to redeem these dollars in gold is beginning to deteriorate, just as it did with England under its gold exchange standard. And the conflict uh, between short-term domestic priorities and the world's long-term monetary needs has been called, I don't know if you've heard of this before, the Triffin Dilemma. It was uh, penned by Robert Triffin, I think he's a Dutch economist, if I got that right. Um, he was absolutely right. There was a conflict between American policy and world international policy. So gold on the open market, because in London, a British citizen could buy gold privately. You still couldn't in the United States. Gold starts to float above $35. So the market is reflecting this loss of confidence in the ability of the U.S. to redeem. Some of the nations of the world pool, their, pool gold and put it in so-called gold pool, and they're constantly dumping gold on the London market, trying to push the price back down to $35, but that can only last for so long. And eventually, the credibility becomes so low that France and Germany begin to request, it seems like the French are always involved in this somehow, begin requesting gold again. Um, U.S. gold reserves start to drain. So the U.S. actually blackmailed these two countries. The United States said, well, you know, we are protecting you from the Soviets, and we might just decide to pull out our military protection if you guys, um, you know, call in your legal right that we, our solemn oath to, to redeem in gold. So Germany, which is right on the border, West Germany is right on the border of East Germany, they back down and acquiesced. But Charles de Gaulle, very nationalistic, he says, too bad, he pulled out of NATO. Uh, develop, France developed its own nuclear weapons, and they said, we, we still want the gold. And um, by the way, I don't blame him. Charles de Gaulle was alive in 1931. I'm sure he remembered when France was effectively, I mean, forgive my this way, but he was effectively screwed over by England uh, when they went off gold after saying they never would. So in some ways, I don't blame him this for... This is the same time when de Gaulle is uh, portrayed in the corporate press as a kind of a demon leader of, of France, right? So they're uh, I don't... Yeah. I'm not familiar with what the press was saying about de Gaulle at the time, but that might be consistent with, uh, so he, de Gaulle, um, he sent a ship to New York City to collect the gold. And, that's right, it was, that's right, exactly. It wasn't just a freighter, he sent a warship. Yeah, he wanted to make sure that on the way back some, some kind of accident didn't happen where, <laughs> where all the French gold winds up at the bottom of the ocean. And I've, I've heard stories, it was like a battleship or something, I don't think it was quite that big, but I, I did some digging. I found a photo of the warship. There it is, right there. Okay. Yep. It's the uh, that's the Louis the Fourteenth or something. Yeah. So. Okay. So um, gold g g surpasses forty dollars an ounce. U.S. reserves are now down from a high of twenty thousand tons in 1958 down to eight thousand one fifty. And if any of you follow the monetary history, twenty thousand tons is just mind-boggling. I mean, today the U.S. has the, large, the largest gold reserves in the world at 8,000 tons. The next nearest country is Germany with about 3,000. And then I can't remember the countries after that, but you start getting down to 2,000, 1,000. And for the United States to have 20,000 tons in 1958, and remember a lot less gold had been mined in 1958 than today. It's really remarkable. So the end game is the British ambassador asked for $3 billion of gold, and that's a third of our remaining gold reserves. And that is what triggers four days later Richard Nixon's famous speech, where he, again, that key word temporarily suspends dollar convertibility to gold. And then so on that date, after thousands of years of money and civil civilization being tied in some way or another to gold or silver, it ends forever. And we've been in what, the th 47 years now? In the fiat era, right? Did France collect its gold? Yes, it did get its gold. Yeah, thank you. How many tons of gold was that? Uh, I don't know what the exact number is. Um, I'm sure it was significant enough for us to threaten them, right? Um, but I think it is available online. I want to say I've read it before, but I just don't remember uh, the amount. Okay, so, um, boy, i got to make up for some lost time here. So it, the theory, now this, is, this is something I put together. I claim total credit or, or blame or responsibility. Um, after everything I've talked about, I want to point out when you have a conversation with someone one day about the gold standard, there's not one kind. Here are seven major or eight major attributes of a gold standard of which uh, either can apply.
for example, you can be on a gold standard where everything is coins. There's not even any paper. You've seen that in the movies in the Middle Ages. Everyone's carrying little bags of jingling coins. That's how they settle, settle all their payments. Or you can have paper substitutes. You can be on a full reserve gold standard where the number of claims must be exactly equal to the gold reserves. Or you can be on a fraction reserve. It can be completely decentralized like it was in the United States before the Fed. Or you can have a central bank with certain privileges. Or you can have a central bank with the ultimate privilege, which is a monopoly on banknotes. You can have a free market where banks either make a profit or they lose money and go out of business. Or you can have a central bank that bails them out as a lender of last resort. You can have gold coin redemption or you can have only gold bullion redemption like the British did. You can have redemption for the entire public or only for central banks. You can have a full gold standard or you can have, like the British had, a gold exchange standard. You can, you can redeem for all claimants, domestic and international, or you can only allow domestic holders to claim or only international holders to claim. So there's no one kind of gold standard. And what I did here, this is probably where I would be criticized. I didn't think this through very close, very carefully, but you'll get the idea. I assigned a score. The freest gold standards, the ones that have the least government interference, I gave a zero. And for every, every type of central bank or government intervention into the monetary system, I, I created one point. So if we go throughout history, we can see how free and how unfree real and alleged gold standards were. So I start here with the Bank of Amsterdam, which for 50 years was a full reserve bank. It gets the score of zero. The lower the score, the freer the system. And if you guys forget what attributes each system had, like I said, the slides will be online so you can pull it down and analyze it more closely later. For those of you who attended my talk in June, the Scottish free, what was called the free banking system, also gets a zero. The only change between it and the Bank of Amsterdam was that it was on a fractional reserve. The Canadian system, from the, from the establishment of the Bank of Montreal until the Central Bank, the Bank of Canada in 1935, it gets a zero. It's very similar to the Scottish system. In the United States, while we had our two antebellum central banks, the first and second banks of the United States, still a very low score of one. The only difference is there was now a central bank and it had privileges to branch, which commercial banks did not, but it didn't have a banknote monopoly. The Bank of England, during the classical gold standard, gets a two or a three, depending on, early, early on in this era, it was not performing a lender of last resort function, but later, after 1871, it began to perform the function, so it gets a three. Okay, the U.S. gold standard on the Federal Reserve gets a three or a four, because during World War I, uh, only domestic claimants of gold could redeem, but outside of World War I, anyone, uh, including overseas holders, could redeem. Also, in the early days of the Fed, uh, private commercial banks could print bank notes, but by the 1920s, the Fed was given a monopoly, and uh, there was no more uh, competitive bank note issuance in the private sector. And then the Bank of England during the interwar gold exchange era, the one that I say is so important, it gets the worst score you can possibly get, okay, a seven, as does the Bretton Woods system. So if you ever have a conversation about the gold standard and someone refers to the Bretton Woods system as the gold standard, they're probably not going to talk about the interwar gold standard in England, but it's a very important period, even though it's only six years. I don't even call these gold standards, okay? If it's a gold exchange standard, to me, it's a sham. Okay? It, the, the word gold is in there, and there's a little gold down here in the base somewhere, but the whole thing is just an inflation machine. Okay, I think for the sake of time, I want to skip some of these theory slides. Um, I'm sure everyone's familiar with this, right? How much the value of the dollar has fallen since the establishment of the Federal Reserve. Um, I think I'd like to go straight to the fallacy.